is really bad, isn't it? You know, everyone knows that NPM is bad. Because, you know, but why is NPM bad? You know, N NPM is bad for a whole bunch of reasons. You know, it installs tons and tons of fiddly little packages. You know, just all of them. There's that gif of all the little things running out of the shed when you install NPM stuff. Um, sometimes those packages just disappear. I mean, who could forget LeftPad? And LeftPad's a ridiculous module to begin with, isn't it? Um, and, you know, sometimes those packages end up with malware in them. You know, who could forget event stream? That was recent, and that was, that was NPM, and that was JavaScript. And NPM is a central point of failure, too. Uh, you know, when it goes over, suddenly half the internet stops working, a bit like GitHub, no wait. Because, <laughs> because all of these things only ever happen to NPM, right? You see, so what we're really talking about when we're talking about things like NPM and, and packages of that ilk is the supply chain. And supply chains are a concept that comes from the more physical world, where you have a, a factory that's making things, but it needs things in order to make those things, or a shop that's selling things, and those things have to get in there, and so it's all the sort of provider relationships and logistics that go into building something. And supply chain has taken on a lot more of a higher profile of late because of things like Bloomberg telling the entire world that they reckon that Supermicro has had people inside their factory. Supermicro makes motherboards for computers, if you haven't heard of them. Um, and Bloomberg reckoned that people had gotten into the factory um, and were installing tiny little chips, no bigger than a grain of rice, onto the, uh, onto the motherboards that were then getting shipped to companies like Apple and Amazon and thus being able to be backdoored and everything was terrible. Um, the most fascinating piece of the story is that almost everybody involved, except for Bloomberg, reckons it's bullshit. Um, all of the customers in question denied it strenuously, including Apple and Amazon, who denied it in the way that would cause them significant legal problems if it actually turned, into, turned out to be true. And so you can be fairly sure that they're confident that it wasn't happening. Um, and also just the process by which this was done is kind of, the, the way that they described it as being done is kind of sketchy. Um, generally this kind of nastiness is done by other means, generally by intercepting something en route, doing something to it, and then shipping it on. But this is not the only kind of risk in a supply chain. Um, the other obvious one is unavailability. Uh, your supplier could run out of stuff, or they could go out of business, or there could be a flood in Thailand and suddenly there are no hard drives. Um, all of these things happen. Um, another thing that happens often in supply chains is things have defects. Um, you buy a thing and it doesn't work, and then you have to send it back. If you replicate this out to a huge extent, you can end up with some hilarious problems. I remember one story of a supercomputer being installed, which consisted of like thousands of nodes, and the thing is, once you've got thousands of nodes, the probability that at least some of the bits that you're using to build those nodes, because they had to build them all out of pieces, were going to break, and so there was this you know, assembly line of people plugging things in. Does it work? No, oh crap, put it over there, get another one. So on and so forth. But we're not talking about hardware here. We're talking about software. And you can map a whole bunch of these concepts onto software as well. Software has a supply chain, but in this case the supply chain is all of the code that you depend on um, that's coming from someone other than you or possibly just other departments in your organization. Um, and those, cannot, those, those can be more or less obvious. I mean, when you've got package dependencies in your language, they can be fairly obvious, but have you ever stopped to think about the fact that your compiler is a third-party dependency? So on, so forth. And so, as in the physical supply chain, the software supply chain has risks in it too. Obvious one, bugs. If your third-party code has a bug in it and it impacts you, that can impact your availability, that can impact your delivery, it can, impact a whole bunch of things. You can have bugs in your microphone can fall off. Um, you can have bugs in code. So, um, you know, obviously you have a bug in the code, some things stop working. I'm just going to hold it here because I'm worried it's just going to pop off again. Um, um, because I gesticulate wildly, you see, and so... Just, um, and so, you know, you've got the bugs in the code, but you can also have bugs in delivery mechanisms. NPM can go down. PyPI can go down, gems can go down, and so on and so forth. Um, and so and that results in the unavailability of packages, and that can have a bunch of impacts to your development workflow when suddenly you can't install a package anymore. But if, you're in, if your deployment process involves um, downloading packages from that repository when you deploy, then it 
Um, another thing that can happen is similar to companies going out of business or deciding to focus on other products, you can have a lack of maintenance. Um, the, one of the biggest problems facing open source software these days is maintenance and the fact that a lot of maintainers are unsupported. Um, both, the, uh, when I referenced the left pad and event stream issues earlier, both of those were directly attributable to some aspect of the main maintainer not wanting to maintain that package anymore. In the case of left pad, uh, the person just had a, a bit of a falling out with the people running NPM over a naming issue and, and just pulled everything. In the case of event stream, the maintainer just wasn't interested anymore and handed it off. Um, of course, these things only happen to NPM. Uh, this is a message from Andrew Godwin basically pointing out that he does not have the, the time and energy and brain space to handle maintaining a package called channels for Django. Channels adds WebSocket and things like that to, to Django and allows you to use those within, that, within the Django framework. Um, and he basically doesn't have the time to maintain it anymore. So if you want WebSocket in Django, then you've got a bit of an existential problem here. Um, and all of this, so that you've got the lack of maintenance, maintenance, you've got bugs, and that's before you even get to the malicious stuff. Um, breaking into your code is something that bad people would like to do. Uh, they may not want to break into your code as much as somebody else's, but at some point they might decide they want to do that. Um, they can try and come in the front door, they can try and break into the API or the login box or whatever to try and get into, uh, get into your, your code that way, or they can try and look for your back-end administrative interface and get in that way, or they could come in via your supply chain. They could try and break into your package host. They could try and break into the code that's in your package host and so on and so forth. And this is, to, in some extent, exactly what happened with EventStream. Um, with EventStream, the maintainer of the package had decided that you know, it was a, a, a package that they'd written to have some fun with a while back, but then people started depending on it, but they weren't interested in maintaining it anymore. Someone comes along and says, hi, I'd like to maintain your package now. And they go, sure. And that person promptly adds a Bitcoin miner. Um, this is what happens when, when maintainers decide that they can't maintain something anymore. And of course, this kind of malicious activity only happens to NPM. Python Nation was more of a thought experiment or a sort of live social experiment than an actual piece of malicious code. But what it did was when you ran pip install Python Nation, it uploaded your etc. password file to a Heroku app. Um, but what this illustrates is another vector for this kind of monkeying around in that it doesn't have to be the code within the package that is attacking you, it can be the installation mechanics that are attacking you. Um, another one uh, similar to that also in the Python space was Colorama. You'll notice that this is spelt the way that we in Australia and New Zealand would spell it. That's not the way the package name is spelled. Uh, Colorama, spelt without a U, is a package for Python that does coloured text for terminals. Colorama with a U was a package that did exactly the same thing and stole all your Bitcoins. Um, and just before we move on, I would like to just have a bit of a chat about this running gag of NPM. Why do people tend to attack NPM? And I have a couple of theories. The first one is sort of a an ecosystem thing in JavaScript. A lot of JavaScript code relies heavily on composition of small bits of code. And when you're doing that kind of composition, they also tend to wrap those up into libraries. And those libraries end up, so you end up with lots of little bits of small, small code, like left pad, because somebody already wrote that, so why bother writing your own? Um, which leads to a larger dependency tree. Um, which leads to a larger supply chain. You've got more points at which your code could be attacked by this vector. Another, th another theory that I have is that Electron is a really big thing. It's a really fun, easy way for companies to make their desktop apps. Um, and you know, if you're a, a, a happy new cryptocurrency thing on the thing and you wanna make a cryptocurrency wallet, then Electron's a good choice, but then someone gets into your NPM code and steals all your Bitcoins. Um, but my other theory as to why you see a lot of ragging on NPM in this one is just straight up contempt. Um, JavaScript is, or at least has been widely considered not one of the cool languages. And so that tends to lead to people just, you know, writing stuff like this off. The problem with that is 
as I said in my first theory, I think the reason why you see a lot of this stuff in NPM is because it's structured in a way that makes it easy to attack in this way. And so really, instead of people who don't write JavaScript a lot going, oh, it's bloody NPM, you should be looking at what's happening to NPM and going, how could this happen to my infrastructure? Because the same kind of attacks that people use on NPM, the same ways that these things show up, are exactly the ways that people could attack your code and your supply chain. And so you really need to think about that and start working out how you're going to mitigate it. So the important thing with risks, apart from identifying them, is mitigating them. Um, so what, have your op what options have you got for mitigating software supply chain risks? Well, I have a really big theory. Support the damn maintainers. One of the, as I said earlier, one of the biggest problems that you have in open source software is that the maintainers are doing this often for no money. They might get a lot of recognition out of it, but recognition doesn't pay the bills. Uh, it's somewhat like exposure in that regard. Um, and so if you are in a profit-making enterprise that is existentially dependent on a piece of open source software, I believe that it behooves you to go and make sure that, that the people maintaining that software are being looked after. Well, um, preferably financially, but if there's some other way that you could, um, that you can make their lives better or, or you know, hire them, um, buy them something that they need, anything like that, make sure that you're doing that. At least make sure that you know who they are because that kind of support means that you're gonna get a better turnaround on looking after your bugs and things like that if you find them. Um, apart from that, or as preferably as well as that, um, you really need to think about the processes that you're using when it comes to adopting third-party code. Um, some people, bracket nerds, bracket, really dislike the word process, um, especially in a corporate setting, I, you know, because you know, process is a tool and pro tools can be used for both good and ill, but process done well is an excellent, excellent thing because it gives you the, a structure in which to think about something. Um, having a process for how third-party dependencies enter your code base means that you can think about, okay, so we're going to take a dependency on this. What does this do to us? Does this impact any of our security critical pathways? Do, does this open us up to anything else? What happens if, this, uh, if we find bugs in this? You don't have to do a whole lot of work on it, but just thinking about it is a good idea. And going along with that, Having a process for handling upgrades and updates in that, that code is really important too. And not just for supply chain risk mitigation. Um, I've worked in organizations before where we've been based heavily on code that was sort of five to seven years out of date. And it took us a whole lot of work to get out from under that. And if you've got a process for how you handle those things, then you can kind of say, okay, we're at the point now where we need to kick off an update cycle and we need to look into that. And then the other part of it is reviewing and auditing third-party code. When you bring in a new version of a package, you're bringing in new code. You should know what that code is. If you're in a security critical thing, if you're handling credit card data, if you're handling personally, if you're handling personally identifying information, all that kind of stuff, you should really know what's going on in that and not just blindly rely on it. Um, and auditing your code base for third-party dependencies is also something you should do on a regular basis because you might go, oh, hang on, we're not using that anymore. Why the hell are we even bringing that in? Um, to give you an example, um, I, I work at Ubico, uh, we handle, uh, we do uh, hardware security tokens and authentication and stuff like that. We're looking at retooling some of our services and some other things and we're looking at a process by which you do a development build which can pull in packages from anywhere but where the resulting artifact is marked as n un unshippable and then having an actual production deployment which can only pull greenlit packages out of a, out of a proxy cache. But that, that artifact is marked as shippable. Because that lets us say, okay, our security team can look at the packages that are coming in saying, this development build that we want to promote has all of these things. All of those we've seen before, they're all fine. This one's new, we should take a look at that. This one's an upgrade, we should take a look at that. And so it gives us touch points to look at those things and make a decision as to how much we need to pay attention to this and what the risks are. So summing up, relying on third-party code introduces risk into your project. Um, this isn't meant to scare you, it's just meant to make you think about what those risks are. Because these risks can be mitigated. 
You just need to have a think about it and work out what your processes are for dealing with it. And lastly, it's not just NPM, it's everything. Um, NPM is not the only thing that suffers security issues. Every single package system out there has had issues, all the way down to Debian mucking up OpenSSL and breaking randomness that then ended up making bad SSH keys. Everyone has it. And the most important thing, I believe, out of this whole presentation, support the maintainers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Benno. Hey. Uh, if you have questions for Benno, uh, if you want to tell him he's wrong, or if you want to tell him that NPN really is the problem, uh, he'll be outside uh, after this talk. Or at least <laughs> for the next be, five be, to ten minutes. Yes, yes. I'll be trying to stay awake. My, my, my plane broke last night, and so I came in very late. Hey, please thank Benno Rice. <laughs> we will...